Hey, hello out there. This is Doc Mike, the Redneck Dentist. Welcome to the show today on Real Liberty Media. I'm going to make a little adjustment here. Hang on. Um, what do I want to do? I want to get rid of that. There we go. Okay, I think everything's good now. Hey, I <laughs> was just watching Oregon State, which is not my team. There's two, there's a few colleges, of course, in the state of Oregon, but I went to the University of Oregon, which is down in Eugene. Oregon State is in Corvallis, and of course, there are rivals. But I was just watching them in the NCAA tournament. They finished last in the Pac-12 conference, but they, in the regular season, but then in the Pac-12 tournament, they finished first. They beat everybody else, and now they've beat a couple teams here in the, the NCAA tournament. They just knocked off Loyola, which was pretty amazing. I really didn't expect them to make it. And like I said, they're not my team, but, you know, they're from Oregon. When you have a big tournament like NCAA, I guess you can... Uh, root for uh, whoever you want and you know it's kind of cool to see Oregon and Oregon State both in the tournament and actually the the uh, women's basketball team from Eugene is also in the tournament uh, the women's tournament so that's kind of cool anyway um, it's kind of a kind of a neat time of the year for college sports and one thing that kind of crossed my mind recently was that uh, the everybody's kind of go, kind of going about life as if it were normal and what I mean by that is here I'm sitting here watching the NCAA tournament and they're just playing basketball and you know uh, having fun I hope and kind of like nothing's going on, you know, even though the stands aren't full like they would be outside of these COVID restrictions we are forced to live under, I guess, if you want to enjoy the tournament anyway. Um, but it kind of surprises me that people don't really understand that you know their, that their country is bas basically being taken away from them, that uh, we're basically being put under like tyr tyrannical rule, and you know everybody's just going about life like it's normal, like this is a normal thing to do, or that they don't really, they aren't really aware that that's what's going on. Um, so I was thinking this week, you know, you hear if you follow news which I try and keep track of some stuff going on in the news just to see what the world is doing and I kept seeing that Myanmar uh, basically had a military overthrow of their supposedly and trust me here I am not a historian in, in any way uh, I don't claim to be I try and keep up on stuff I try and look at um, history, but I'm certainly not a history buff. But I was wondering, okay, I guess in the last 24 hours, the military in Myanmar who has taken over Myanmar politically, I guess they killed a bunch of people, like 90, I saw one report was 93, one report was like 110, 114, who knows how many in the last 24 or 48 hours, something like that. So I was kind of translating that to what's going on in our country. And even though nobody is actually dying yet, well, supposedly, uh, depends on how you look at it, but at least our government isn't outright shooting us in the street yet, although some might argue they are. Um, we... I wanted to. I, I was wondering. Okay, so I don't know Myanmar. I, I don't know what it is. You know, it's a, apparently a small country, or you know, at least it's a country. Uh, and I was wondering. Okay, so what are the people in Myanmar doing? I mean, are they resisting? And of course, there is a civilian uh, up 
uprising, you could call it. So I was thinking, okay, well, are they armed? I mean, do they have a means of getting weapons? And of course, my belief is that anywhere in the world, if you want a weapon, you could get a weapon. It's just a matter of having the means to get that weapon. In fact, one of my rules of travel is I don't travel anywhere where I cannot have a firearm in one form or another uh, because people have asked me, you know, I guess people assume if you're a dentist, you do all these exotic things. And I, and I can see that's probably true for a lot of dentists. I know a lot of my peers do a lot of that kind of stuff. But like, you know, if people ask me, well, have you been, you know, to another country? My answer is always no, because I can't carry a gun there. <laughs> and I, I don't know what it is about me and the way I was raised or the beliefs that I instilled in myself. I certainly didn't get it from my family, but uh, I've always wanted to have protection. I think one thing was, I might have alluded to this before, but um, there was uh, something happened in my family uh, when I was 18 that shouldn't have happened in a civilized society where people treat each other with respect and dignity, but it did. And it was a horrible event. It wasn't to me, it was to my sister. And she was basically left for dead. She is not dead, thank God. Um, but she was left for dead. And man, I, I think at that time I thought, you know what? Okay, yeah, we're all tough. You know, and I hear this a lot from people, especially women who I try and encourage to defend themselves with firearms, to carry concealed weapon or carry open carry. And time and time again, you know, they tell me, "Oh, I'm so tough that uh, you know nobody's gonna nobody's gonna be able to you know violate me or abuse me or whatever." And I just think to myself. That is so short-sighted because you have no idea how evil people can be until you're in that situation. And you may think that you're tough, but I'm telling you, I mean, I, so I've seen violence and evil myself, of course. I'm sure we all have. I made a decision sometime in my life probably around the time I was an adult, 18, 19, 20, something like that, that I would never permit somebody to be abused or violently um, abused in front of me, that it was just never going to happen. So, and I'm I'm not that tough of a guy, I, I wouldn't say. I mean, I'm realistic to know that there's always somebody bigger and badder than me around. Uh, I don't claim to be a tough guy. I, I studied martial arts for some years. And, uh, you know, it was another thing that I did to give me an upper hand in some cases. But the bottom line is, you know, when you look around the world, when you see people uh, who have the intent of doing violent harm to other human beings, generally the only way to stop that is with a firearm. And you see it time and time again. I mean, yeah, sometimes I guess some negotiations can work, but the bottom line is firearms stop pretty much anything. So where was I going with this? Oh yeah, Myanmar. So I was looking at Myanmar and I was like, okay, so so are, are they able to get weapons? And it turns out that, and it depends on what um, set of records you look at, but apparently, you know, okay, so one one set of data that I was looking at said that 
it's legal for civilians to have firearms, but because it's a licensing system, they're very uh, strict on who actually can have firearms. So I think it was maybe since the 70s they've had this licensure process and you know it's been very difficult to get firearms so of course you know I was listening to the new administration and I noticed some language start showing up lately and I wish I would have written it down because I know it was uh, the vice president Harris who said something like you know, let's ignore let's ignore the non-starter argument that we're after your guns because we are not after your guns. And I was thinking to myself, yeah, you are. You know, anytime you start putting restrictions on those of us who obey the law and are safe with our weapons and have our weapons for the very purpose that the Second Second Amendment allows us to have those guns. Anytime you start taking away or infringing on that, yeah, you're after our guns. So, uh, you know, so looking at another country, I mean, so that was what fifty years ago, maybe let's say that they had that they changed their laws and didn't allow civilians to have guns. And now look at them. There's no way to fight back. There's no. I mean, so you're going to go to a fight against a, a military with rocks, Molotov cocktails, bats, you know, knives. It's not going to work real good. You you just unless you have like overwhelming number of bodies to sacrifice it's just not going to work very good unless you're armed so I don't know what's going to happen there but hopefully we don't uh, hopefully we continue to protect our second amendment rights here in this in this country and don't allow the false narratives that keep coming out I was thinking to myself when one of those, uh, I don't know who it was uh, in the administration was talking about we needed, you know, more stringent background checks. And I was thinking to myself this. Yeah, maybe we need more background checks, but this is what I would like to see first. Is let's say liars can't have guns because right away no politician would be able to have a gun no lawyer would be able to have a gun and no celebrities would be able to have a gun and think about this those three classes of people or categories of people make their living lying lawyers I mean I'm sure that they think they're doing it for some kind of purpose to serve mankind or to defend somebody or to further a lawsuit or to prosecute somebody for that matter. But they all have to manipulate the truth in order to do that. You know, it would be so simple if when somebody went to trial, everybody just told the truth. I mean, number one, trials wouldn't last very long. Because it would be simple, right? It would be quick and easy. Just like, okay, you did this. You know, you're admitting to this. Whoops, made a bunch of noise there. Sorry about that. And, you know, whoever is uh, whoever's on the other side can make their little argument or claims about whatever. And then, you know, the judge makes a decision or the jury or whoever. And then on we go with our lives. But no. You know, time after time, you know, the laws are misconstrued or taken out of context or lawyers are manipulating the facts to get whatever purpose they're trying to prove proven so they lie I mean they that's kind of what you do in court is lie you manipulate the story to fit your you know to fit your um, I, I don't, I don't know the word I'm looking for. Anyway, but you, but you manipulate the facts so that your side looks better. 
because that's the bottom line. You know, you're trying to make your your side look better. So lawyers are out. Politicians, I mean, Jesus. Do you, do we need any more proof than just watching any campaign year? I mean, every single year that there's an election, you look at, you see both sides bringing up what the other side said 16 months ago or 16 years ago or 12, 10 years, it doesn't matter. If you ever said something contrary to what you were saying now in this campaign, well, you're going to hear about it. And guess what? They all do it. They all do it. So I, both, you know, Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, and anybody else who's going to run for office, I think, will be dishonest during campaign time. You have to be. You, and that's the thing. Like, if somebody actually ran for office and, and just was really factual and just told the truth, they'd never get elected. They wouldn't even, they, they wouldn't make it through a, a couple months of campaigning which is really unfortunate. But uh, I think it would be really refreshing to see somebody like that. There's one, one thing I thought that Trump was really good at. He got under people's skin so easily because he, he didn't really play the game too much. He was a politician still, but, uh, but he didn't play the game so much. And I think that just really irritated a lot of people. So, and the third category of people I was talking about is the uh, is celebrities, and I'm telling you, nothing in the world irritates me more than to have somebody who's made their living by lying. I think that's maybe a little bit aggressive but basically they take on a personality and sell it so they're when they're acting they're lying to you it's maybe good lying you know it's so that we can be entertained but gee many christmas they're experts at lying and then those same people because they've had some great success in you know, fast times at Ridgemont High, let's say, or, you know, whatever they've become famous for. And then they come out and think they can tell you about saving energy or saving the world or saving some wildlife population somewhere that, you know, that suddenly they have some interest in. So they come out like some kind of expert and I'm I'm telling you I don't think I think if they didn't have people coaching them completely on what to say or have somebody give them all the talking points they I mean number 1 they seem pretty stupid anyway trying to tell it tell us about you know saving the planet or whatever uh but um <laughs> but they uh, I lost my train of thought. Man, I'm old. I hate it when I get so far off in the bushes I can't remember how to get back, but that's okay. The bottom line is uh, the celebrities really bother me, and they shouldn't have guns. I mean, that's that simple. They come out and talk about, you know, how horrible these mass shootings are, and that's another thing I was going to talk about. Where are all of my concealed carry or open carry people? You know... How does somebody walk in a supermarket with who knows how many people that were in there? How does somebody walk in there and kill however many people and wound however many people without somebody returning fire? I'll tell you how. Because so many people aren't carrying a gun. So many people are wandering around in this world unarmed unprotected, depending on somebody else to do something. I've said before, I carry a gun because the cop's too heavy. And how far away is a cop? Well, they're four to seven minutes away in most big cities. Four to seven minutes. How many people can you kill in four to seven minutes? Apparently 10, 14, 20, 50, if the crowd's big enough. Um, it irritates me 
it really irritates me because I think when I'm in a supermarket or when I'm, I hate going to places where there's a lot of people. But, you know, by necessity, you have to go out in public and do some stuff. So when I'm out there, I'm hoping that there are others like me out there. I don't want to be the only one returning fire, but I will be. I am not afraid of it. I think that if you're going to carry, if you're going to carry a firearm, you better have that conversation with yourself. Are you going to pull the trigger when the time comes? Because if you have that conversation when that person is coming around a corner, it might be too late because maybe you haven't thought it through enough to know I am going to kill this human being. I'm going to shoot them dead center mass and stop them. Because if you have any hesitation, well, you're going to be in the wrong position to do anything. You know, and I think hope that if you carry a firearm that you're familiar with it that you know exactly what it does know exactly what it can do and know how to get it to do what it can do you know when I get a new firearm that I'm carrying I every day I put it together I take it apart I load it I unload it I make sure it's safe. I make sure it's ready to fire. I make sure it's safe. I take it apart. I put it back together several times a day just so I know that that thing is ready to go. I'll tell you, one time uh, I still have this little uh, handgun. It's a, uh, I was going to say a 38, but it's actually a 380. It's a real small handgun, kind of my favorite because it could used to be my favorite because it would go right in my pocket like my where my where my hands go right in my pocket of my jeans or pants or whatever and um you know it had enough power to stop somebody uh real easy simple seven rounds you know accurate enough that I was going to hit somebody in front of me um I should say too during my time in the um, public health service, I was in the, I, I worked in the federal prison system, had to have firearms training several times a year, well, at least once a year. And if you were on any of the special teams, then you had firearms training more often. But I've always loved firearms, so I've always, you know, kind of made sure that I was uh, capable and safe. But anyway, that stupid 380, man, I would hear it once in a while. The little button that held the magazine in, like it, if it pressed against my leg or if my hand touched it, it would kick the magazine out, <laughs> like in my pocket. So then I would know I've only got one round in this gun, <laughs> and that always kind of irritated me. So that gun doesn't get to travel with me so much anymore. But man, it is handy because it's nice and small and, um, you know, when the magazine stays in, it's awesome. But I knew even when I carried it and it did that, I knew, okay, I reach in my pocket and slam the magazine back in or quietly squeeze the magazine back in to make sure that uh, it's going to be safe and ready to use. Or if I had to take it out, I would, the first thing I would do is make sure that magazine was plugged in as I drew it out of my pocket. But fortunately, I never had to do that with that gun. Anyway, so, um, the guy that shot those people in the supermarket, I really wish there was somebody around to stop him. And I wish there were more people in the world to stop those kind of people. See, my life, I guess my perfect world would be that we all carry guns or that so many of us carry guns that people would think twice about doing that kind of stuff. Although, honestly, 
Some people are just crazy. You know, so, sometimes it isn't race. Sometimes it's not, you know, racially motivated hate that does it. Sometimes it's not terrorism or a terrorist. Sometimes... It's just a crazy bastard who lost his marbles and goes and kills people. The problem is we're always trying to justify what somebody does because a lot of people just can't believe that some people are just evil. The evil exists in this world. There's good in this world. There's bad in this world. Some people just suck. And I wish there were more of us in the world who were willing to able and ready to stop those people. I'm sure you've all heard before, evil exists because good people stand by and do nothing. And I'll be honest with you, if you're unarmed, you are less likely to do something to somebody who's shooting and killing human beings around you. Because of course I think everybody has a little bit of that self-preservation mode where um, I'm not going to run directly in the line of fire to stop somebody because I'm going to get killed. I mean, there's a lot of people who don't want to get killed. You know, it's a funny saying. They say, don't pick a fight with an old man because he'll just shoot you. And that's kind of where I am in life. But I know I would lay my life down for a fellow human being, but I'm not going down without a fight. And it's going to be as fair a fight as I can make it. So I really didn't expect to spend half an hour talking about that, but I guess I did. And I think I'm going to take a little break. I'm going to play the commercial, and I will be back in just a couple of minutes. Let's see. Um, yeah. I'll be right back. Maybe. Maybe I'm not going yet. <laughs> oh, here we go. This is Duck Mike, the Redneck Dentist here on Real Liberty Media. Would you like to be entertained, enlightened, and or educated? Tune in to Real Liberty Media and catch live shows or listen to podcasts from diverse shows such as Behind the Woodshed with Hal Anthony, Evolutionarily Engaging Counter-Propaganda Tactics and Related Works, or you could listen to It's All Connected with Grim Near and Circle. They show you how all things are connected. Free your mind with Grimner and Moose Girl. See your way beyond the world as it has been defined. Sunday Blues with Grimner. Grimner plays all kinds of blues from great oldies to modern hard rocking blues. Join us in the chat room for fun times and a trivia contest. It's a lot of fun and has great conversation. A Ponder Gander with Vin E., to think and reason, raising expectations through provoking episodes. If you cannot do great things, do small things in a great way. You can join us for the Top 10 Countdown with Gary L. and Gigi's Boo. They play the Top 10 songs from years past and provide some interesting historical facts and trivia about songs and the era. Take your pick. They are all great shows, and you will have an opportunity to chat with other listeners and hosts of the shows. Come on over to join Real Liberty Media. See you there. was a rant wasn't it or something I don't know but 
I guess it's something I feel strongly enough about that I went on for kind of a long time. Anyway, so <laughs> where do we go from here? Oh, one other thing I was going to say about um, about the whole mass shooting thing and people trying to pass more gun laws. And it's something that I always think about whenever, whenever I hear anybody wanting to pass more gun laws. And that's this. I'm pretty damn certain it's illegal to kill people in a supermarket. But that didn't stop anybody. It also bothers me that we have gun-free school zones. Like our children and our grandchildren are absolutely unprotected. It drives me crazy that there are gun-free zones anywhere. It makes us all a little unsafer. I have one more thing to say about this, and we got to get off, or it's going to take the whole hour. The freaking Ninth Circuit Court, federal court, basically just made it illegal for anybody in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and I don't know, some other states, to carry period or they said there wasn't they said there wasn't a constitutional right to carry that that's not exactly what the constitution says of course the ninth circuit court is one of the most overturned courts in the land so i'm sure it'll be overturned eventually but holy crap you know it so irritating okay off of that topic, I wanted to talk about some really fun or stupid stuff too. So one thing I was noticing this week, uh, if you <laughs> saw this ship that's stuck in the Suez Canal, I kept hearing, I kept hearing the explanation be that um, that the ship was blown off course during a sandstorm. Now, I don't know if y'all had noticed that the ship is is jacked sideways in a canal that the ship is obviously wider than or no, the ship's length is longer than the canal's width. Now, I don't know how you get blown off course when the course is a very narrow body of water. <laughs> but I do understand that somehow they lost control and got it stuck in the sand. And it's kind of funny. Um, somebody told my wife, uh, you know, it's kind of funny. Everybody's looking for, you know, we're in the technology age right now. This is high tech everything. And yet we're just waiting for a guy with a shovel to dig this freaking boat out of the sand. <laughs> I thought that was awesome. Okay, I'll tell you one thing um, that I was thinking about. Let's see if this is the next most important thing I wanted to talk about. I want to make sure I get everything covered. Uh, oh, God, yeah. Okay, can you guys... Oh, first of all, let's just say this. So... You know, the COVID-19, whatever they want to call it. I don't know. They have some description for it. You know, and they also say that they've isolated, you know, whatever. They they know what it looks like, in other words. But this is something I have a problem with. You notice that, let's say they say there's a South African variant. And then all of a sudden they say, oh, and this South African variant has shown up in San Francisco or it's shown up in Minneapolis or it's shown up in Miami or whatever. And one day, I'm not kidding, it was like one day they said a new variant has been uh, discovered in somewhere. And the next day, the very next day, I read a news story how so many um water treatment plants or sewage treatment plants or whatever in 
so many counties in Texas had tested and found this variant in their sewage. Now here's my problem. <clears throat> I don't know when the variant happened. I don't know when that that uh, mutation took place that caused the virus to go from COVID-19 wild is what they call the original one to COVID-19 South African or COVID-19 UK or COVID-19 Philippines or whatever. But then, so let's say it, let's say it happened a week ago and then it's got to take I don't know. I mean, it's got to take some days for somebody to actually get sick. It's got to take some days for them to get sick enough to go to the hospital and get tested and get blood drawn and whatever. And for somebody to run that, uh, I guess, genetic uh, mapping to find out if that virus is the same or different than, you know, the COVID wild. And then to make that information known to the rest of the world, it's, you would think it's got to take, well, at least a day, even though we have all this technology where people can communicate rapidly. And then how do you get a test like all of a sudden to somewhere in Texas where they're apparently testing the water treatment plants, the sewage treatment plants, and apparently they're taking samples from those plants and running it against known variants? I mean, seriously, how does that happen? I think about 15 years ago, I uh, was listening to the radio. I was listening to Glenn Beck at the time, and he was saying even then, he said, be careful what you believe, what you see or hear, may not be true. And I, I think that's one thing I love about people here at Real Liberty Media. The people you the the other shows here on Real Liberty Media, the other people who have shows have great minds and they're not stuck in thinking a certain way. If you haven't checked out some of the other shows, please visit Real Liberty Media and check out some of the other shows. Just some fantastic people here with great minds keeps you going keeps you thinking uh, challenges you to think freely but my point is I don't you know the government lied to us from the very beginning about this COVID-19 thing and so far they've been pretty They've been pretty successful at keeping everybody um, locked down, so to speak. Keeping all the sheep heading in the same direction. But you have to look at some of this stuff with just some common sense and know that it can't possibly be true. And I'm not saying that I know for a fact that these variants are bullshit. But I'm telling you, man, I, if you just look at some timelines and start putting it together, I would like somebody. I would like someone with, I was going to say authority, but hell, there isn't anybody anymore. You know, here's the deal. You hear a lot of people talking about the science today. The science is not science. The science is some subject that people want you to believe. It isn't actual science with research and double-blind studies and statistical analysis and conclusions that form their conclusion from actual research. 
You know, researchers can't even, most of our research comes out of academic institutions. Well, there's another problem because look at what our ex, uh, our, our um, academic institutions are doing these days. They don't get money. In order to get money from the government, in addition to the money they get every year just for being an institution of higher learning, I guess, the only way they get money is by saying they're going to study something that the government approves of or that the current the the current um popular belief is so like um you know green energy you can't today do a study on how awesome fossil fuel is because nobody's going to give you any money for it. Now, if you want to continue to be a successful professor or a successful department at some university, let's take psychology, for example, or, yeah, psychology. You can't say, I'm going to do a study and show that white people aren't racist because nobody's going to give you money for that. If you want money, you have to get on board with whatever the current popular thinking is. So you have to say, we're going to show how much hate there is coming from white people or how much racism there is against uh, Asian Americans or how much cops, you know, only shoot unarmed black people and why cops do that. You you can't do research that won't support those arguments. And that's really sad because basically we're living in a time when the only thing we're going to hear is basically false narratives. It's only crap produced from these institutions because they have to say that they're going to do that in order to get money from the government, in order to continue getting grants from whomever. They have to say that they're going to, you know, support whatever thing it is that, you know, your government's trying to sell you, our government's trying to sell us. And that's really sad. You know, the one thing, I, I wish I'd known... 50 years ago what was coming just in my lifetime because uh, you know people talk about global warming all the time and how much the oceans have changed I mean I've had people tell me that because the uh, Arctic has melted oops sorry hit my microphone that the Arctic has melted that you know so much uh, so much of the uh, you know, uh, the glacial ice has melted, the seas are, are rising. And I can tell you, I have been able to go to the exact same beaches here in Oregon, and they are cold, by the way. The beaches in Oregon are not where you go to sun and play in the water. The water is freezing cold, and it's usually cold and foggy at the beach in Oregon, too. It's not like you don't hear people saying they're they're going to go to Oregon Beach for the uh, for their spring break unless they live in Oregon and they're completely broke <laughs> because it is not the kind of place that you would want to sp spend your time. But my point is, I can go to the exact same tide pools. You know, tide pools like uh, they're, you know carved out of rock, you know, little pools in rock and stuff. I can go to the exact same tide pools at low tide that I've been to for 50-something years. I'm 63 years old. I moved to Oregon. I think we were, I was 12 or 13 when we moved to Oregon. And even before that, we came to Oregon because my mom had family here. And we would always go to the coast and certain places at the coast, you know. And I, I remember those places. And I live here now, 45 minutes from the coast. And I see those same areas. I see the same tide pools I've been going to 
you know, my entire life. But unless the rocks have moved up with the <laughs> with the rising sea levels, nothing has changed. For me, nothing has changed. So I just hope that we think about things kind of realistically, challenge things that you hear. The things that we hear today, uh, you know, you really have to be weary, wary of, you know, and that's what I, my grandkids, I know I said this before, I, I always am just trying to teach them to think. It's not necessarily to be good at math or to be good at science or to be good at English or to be good at history or to be good at any one or all of those topics, but to have a critical mind and to load your mind with the ability to think. So many people today and I see this in young people. I'll give you another example. This is kind of interesting. I won't snitch him out because I don't want to point out which one it was. But let's just say my grandson was cleaning out bird feeders yesterday. No, not bird feeders. Nest boxes. Because at this time of the year, um, the uh, western bluebirds will show up. And we have some nest boxes that are specifically for western bluebirds. Now here's the thing. Swallows like western bluebird houses. So we clean them out, you know, at this time of year to make sure that they're ready to go for the western bluebirds when they show up. And we keep cleaning them out to keep the swallows from nesting in there and taking away nesting places for the western bluebirds because trust me on this there's no science to support it but right now on this property there are far more freaking swallows than there are western bluebirds <laughs> there's no shortage of swallows okay so here's the deal he's 10 years old so he, he's got a lot to learn he called me down there I was up uh, actually, I think I was putting a tiller on the tractor. I was doing something with the tractor yesterday, and he called me down there. He said, Papa, I need help. And he's about, I don't know, 100 yards away, so I went down there to help him. He said, I can't get this, I can't get the bottom of the bird feeder back up in there, and he's pushing really hard, and he couldn't get it to go in there. And I just looked at him a minute because there's a little block on the, so so let's say the bluebird nesting box has a false a floor in it that you can drop down. So you unscrew the little screw, you drop the the bottom out, and then you can rake out any old nesting materials or crap that's in there, and then you close it. Well, there's a little block in there that, um, well, number one, the screw screws into, and number two provides a little more support to the nesting box. And as you close, <laughs> this is going to sound so stupid to most of us. But anyway, as you close the bottom, that block has to line up and slide in to the nest box. And then you just screw the screw closed and you're done. Well, here's the deal. It was turned 180 degrees so that the so that it kind of stuck out and as you s tried to close the bottom it would just <laughs> the block would just hit the wall of the bluebird house and he he was like pushing as hard as he can he says see it won't go and i just like reached up and turned the block 180 degrees and i closed the bottom and i just said i just said you have to learn to solve problems because this wasn't difficult I mean, if you just looked at it a minute, just tinker with it a minute, you would have figured it out. But, um, you know, he, and it's kind of, 
it's kind of sad that he didn't, you know, kind of try a little bit harder to solve that problem. But my, and that's kind of where I was getting to, is you have to be able to figure things out because you're not going to get too far if you don't know how to solve problems. And you don't want to be stuck waiting for somebody else to come and fix something that you should be able to fix yourself. I guess that's one thing I really like about being like the redneck dentist. I was out tilling today because we need to put some we need to put some grass not grass some pasture grass down like winter rye and alfalfa and I don't know what else we're going to put in there but um but something because we it really got torn up this year so and it's been wetter than heck so so I uh was up was out tilling till I don't know maybe uh well half hour before the show something like that and um, it's kind of funny to be like the redneck dentist and be out doing some tilling and, you know, working on the tractor, or working on whatever, just doing stuff around here. And then, uh, you know, during the week I go in and I be like this real civilized dentist and provide, you know, health care to people. It's kind of interesting. And, I, oh, I, I was going to tell you guys something else. Uh, this is a lot more personal, kind of more about my life here, but... Uh, one thing is, I have like the greatest wife in the world. Uh, she uh, loves to landscape. And I mean, I, I can, you know, if she needs something done, I'll do it. Be, but she's like the mastermind of putting this place together. And I mean, yeah, the inside and the house and all that, but mostly the outside. We have the most incredible environment here. And recently, we've really been enjoying it because I think I told you guys a few weeks ago about the owl that took the raccoon that was in the north pasture, that the coons had a, a, a den in the ground, and I caught them on the game camera. And uh, um, anyway, so we have owls. We've been watching uh, a, mated, a, mating, a mated pair of bald eagles that cruise over Oh, every couple of days we'll see them, you know, flying over. They're checking out the property. We have osprey that come by. Same thing. They just cruise over the property. There's a falcon that comes through once in a while, and all the birds scatter. This morning we were sitting in the hot tub, and our hot tub is outside on the back deck, and it kind of looks over the Yamhill Valley, uh, kind of looks toward the coast to the west a little bit. Uh, but we're sitting out there, and like 40 quail came out of the the um, woods that that uh, borders our property and just we're going across our south pasture and we're just like sitting in the tub watching all these all these um, all these quail come out uh, uh, last night my wife was up <laughs> for a few hours because the cat was torturing these two owls that were hanging out all night long because the cat would get in the window and kind of call to him. Not call to him, but she made this certain noise. And then the owls would just like take off and be flying back and forth right over the, like right around the house, trying to figure out where this cat was. And then she would take off running into another room <laughs> in the house. And then she'd come back to that window and she'd make that whatever. It was kind of like a kind of a growling, moaning sound. And those owls would you know, come looking for her again. Last night we were in the hot tub uh, just after sunset, so it wasn't quite dark and it wasn't light. And bats are coming out and flying around. I love bats because they eat mosquitoes. But my, anyway, I didn't really want to get too far <laughs> off the, uh, uh, you know, I didn't really want to go that far into it. What I wanted to say is we have the greatest environment up here. It's only five acres but it's the greatest five acres. In fact, my wife and I have said before, like when we think about going somewhere, you know, going somewhere to go, I don't know, camping or to go see something, we think there's no reason to leave here. I mean, you know, we have deer wander through all the time. They were on the on the road that goes around the north, uh, north end of the property this morning. Um, 
you know, there's varmints too. There's coyotes and coons, possums, skunks. Um, there's bobcats. There has been a cougar the last few years. Every few years, cougar shows up and wanders around and raises heck until somebody gets it. But anyway, uh, it's just kind of a great environment. Uh, really, really nice. Oh, by the way, uh, maybe I'll include in the blog notes this week, I'll put a link to my YouTube channel. I'm not a YouTuber, but I had a YouTube channel for a while, and I'll tell you why. Is because if you want to share like video with family who doesn't live in the same area, you can just toss a video up there, and then they can all just look at it. They don't have to download it. You don't have to send it by phone. You know all that stuff. You can make it however long you want. Although I guess there are some limits. But um, but anyway, I have a I, I have a drone video. I was actually kind of screwing around with my drone, trying to kind of hold it in one place. But you could actually, uh, you can go there and have a look at, from the drone. You can kind of see what I'm talking about if you want. I know it would make it a little bit more uh, personal, I guess, for you when I'm talking about things on the show. You know, as you can tell, uh, I'll talk about just about anything. <laughs> And I also like to throw in some stuff about, uh, you know, dentistry or my life here or whatever. So um, I'll put that link in the blog notes and you guys can go have a look if you want. I don't. I think there's some old videos up there, too, of I raised goats for a while, uh, kind of getting back to the food thing. Um, goats are a great way to have some meat around and actually if you milk your does goat milk is fantastic and it's actually really good for you and I'm actually going to make a note so next week I'm going to talk about the benefits of goats and goat milk and we actually have been kind of kicking around that the idea of doing it again because it was so fantastic to have to have goats uh and if you haven't eaten goat meat don't think about it right now it's delicious you have to make sure you kill the bucks before they get mature though because uh goats do something kind of gross I'll tell you about next week but it it really taints the meat so and there's certain kind of goats that uh, produce a lot more meat in a shorter period of time so it's a really good uh, a really oh uh, Vinny has uh, has eaten goat milk uh, goat meat and uh, that it's true it's uh, <laughs> you want but, Beetle, what do you want to know? The gross thing that goats do or something else? <laughs> I think, um, yeah. Well, if you, if you, okay, okay, Vinny, um, Beetle, this is what they do. Okay, so goats have this nice little beard on their chin, right? And they have nice horns and stuff. Yeah, Vinny got it. But it's not only piss, Vinny. <laughs> they ejaculate on their chin hair and face so that they, that's their perfume to to make them attractive to their mates. So here's the deal, because I actually tried to eat a male goat that had gotten to the mature had become mature before uh, I slaughtered it. And I'll tell you, so, you know, it gets on their face and their neck because, you know, I mean, they're not great shots. They just, you know, that's where it goes. And it kind of soaks in that. <laughs> it soaks in their fur and it soaks in that meat. So all that neck meat, which the kind of goats I had, they had really good, um, they had really good neck muscles. You know, uh, boar goats are really good meat goats, and Kiko K I K O Kiko goats are also really good for meat. But uh, 
so when I butchered that male, and I'm one of those kind of guys, I, I really want that animal's life to have been worth something. So I'm going to try and eat however much of it I can eat. So I made this really spicy curry mix with the neck meat from the goat. And I tried to eat it. And every time I got it close to my mouth, okay, I actually took a few bites and I did get a couple bites I didn't could actually swallow a couple bites but man after about two maybe three every time I tried to get that <laughs> meat past my nose and I could smell that goat it was just like no I'm not doing this I think the dogs got to eat that meat anyway that's going to wrap it up for this week Hey, thanks so much for listening to Doc Mike, the Redneck Dentist. I hope I see you guys all next week. And be sure to tune in to Real Liberty Media and check out some of the other shows. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week.